I'm Dr. Jerry Calvin McKinney, and we'd like to talk to you tonight about the Holy Spirit. Specifically, we're going to talk about the functions of the Holy Spirit. Um, and more specifically, we're going to focus tonight on the Spirit of Truth. We do have a website called McKinneyMinistries.com, M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y, Ministries.com. I want to talk about the spirit of truth. One of the major problems that we face is that we have allowed society and contemporary thinking to uh, assign meaning to words, and then when we take that meaning into the scripture, it doesn't fit, and so we come out with a warped view of the scripture. And the word truth is like that. Because truth actually in the scripture refers to spiritual truths or spiritual principles. Uh, you get on the witness stand, you say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And yet nothing they're discussing there has anything to do with truth whatsoever. Whether you caught a bass that weighed 10 pounds or 8 pounds, whether you exaggerate it or not, has nothing to do with the truth. Truth is spiritual principles, and there's no spiritual principles connected to your fishing trip. Uh, there could be, but probably not. And so truth is spiritual truth. The world knows nothing of God's truth, uh, but you and I are supposed to be experts on truth. And so truth is inseparably connected to God's word. You say, well, what is God's word, is it? But, and, cat, wherefore? You see, we define a word as a, a little, you know, three, five, ten letters word, like irresponsible is a word. But in the scripture, a word doesn't have anything to do with that whatsoever. A word is a principle or concept <clears throat> that is taught in the scripture and that is a word. So if I said, God is love, or herein is love, not that we loved him, but that he first loved us, that's a word. And not a one word like bud or cat, but a word is a statement of truth spoken by the mouth of God. Of course, for it to get to us, it has to be intercepted by the mind and spirit of someone who speaks it forth. So all through the Old Testament, it says the word of the Lord came to Elijah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. But actually, the word Lord is all capitals. It's God's personal name, Yahweh. So the word of Yahweh comes to people. They intercept it and bring it forth. And as they speak it, it is a living word. So word is inseparable from spirit because word is when God breathes. When the scripture says all scriptures given by inspiration of God, that inspiration of God, theonustros, it's God breathed. And so a lot of times we say, well, the Bible is the word of God. And technically, that's, you know, in a casual sense, that's true. But technically speaking, that's not true. Techli technically speaking, the Bible is a collection of thousands of words of God, all placed together, covering more than 3,000 historical years with all this drama involved. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. But the word is like when Elijah says, uh, to King Ahab, uh, I'm not the troubler in Israel. You are the troubler in Israel. That's the truth, right? So truth is connected to word, and word is only principles in the Scripture or principles that God breathes into us. For instance, in Hebrews 7.7, 7, the writer of Hebrews is discussing um, how Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And he says, without contradiction, the less is blessed of the better, or the lesser is blessed by the greater. We 
word that in modern terminology and we say blessings flow downhill, right? And so the fact that Melchizedek was on a spiritual level much higher than Abraham, that's a spiritual truth. Or that's a truth. If I said Abraham was six feet tall, that can neither be true nor false. Because someone's height has no spiritual meaning. What difference would it make if Jesus was 5'10 or 6'2 or 5 feet tall? It wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. It has no spiritual bearing on anything whatsoever. So first, if you're going to talk about the spirit of truth, you have to figure out that we're not talking about Joe caught a catfish that weighed 20 pounds and you measured it and, it and weighed it and it only weighed 10 pounds. And you say, well, he lied. He didn't tell the truth. No, it, truth has nothing to do. If you want to understand the scripture, you have to put away all the things of our society and our culture and start figuring out what does the Bible say? What is this word, this scripture, this Biblos? And Bible is just the word Biblos. Uh, it's a Latin word. It just means a book. That's all it means. But truth means spiritual truth. Truth does not mean uh, you said you did it in four hours, but it actually took five. That's not truth. It has nothing to do with the truth. But if you lie about your neighbor, who maybe your neighbor is a very gracious and kind person, you said, why, he's meaner than the devil. Well, now you've lied against the truth because... He has a spiritual substance, and he is who he is, and he is what he is. And if you swear that he's something else, then you've lied against the truth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so when we see truth in Scripture, we should think spiritual truths or spiritual principles, specifically things that were breathed, that came out of God's mind and were spoken into the Spirit by God, received by prophets and the, the fathers of old and spoken by them. And so truth is not a statement of a doctrine. Truth is a spiritual reality. Do you see the distinction? It's not a statement of doctrine because if you took a simple one-page statement of faith and had a hundred ministers write a statement of faith, one page only, all hundred of them would be significantly different because they're approaching it all from a different basis or a different perspective. So truth means spiritual truth. Truth is connected to the word, and a word is not a cat or a dog or a frog. A word is a principle or meaning or identification it is something spoken by God that conveys a spiritual reality. The lesser is blessed by the greater. Very simple. I am five feet, 11 and a half inches tall. That's not truth. I am filled with the spirit of the living God. That's truth. Truth has to be about spiritual reality. It cannot be about something else. When I told my wife the first time, I love you madly and I have to marry you and you have to be mine. I was conveying a spiritual reality. Now, if I didn't really love her and said such a thing, I would be lying against the truth and God would be very unhappy with what I'd said. And that's why it's very important that we do not misrepresent our brothers and sisters or anyone because they are a spiritual being, and if we misrepresent them, we're misrepresenting Christ in them and the spiritual reality God has placed in them. Let's look at a few scriptures tonight about the spirit of truth. The first one I want to look at is in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, a beautiful scripture. John chapter 8, I'm going to begin reading in verse 31. Verse 31, John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if, and that's a big if, if you abide in my word, the spiritual principles I'm teaching you, 
then you shall know the truth. You have to live in it to know it. You can't know something beyond your experience. You'll never understand the new birth until you've been born again. You cannot understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit until you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So preachers who aren't baptized in the Holy Spirit, they can teach for six months on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's insanity. You cannot comprehend truth beyond your experience. You have to experience it. The new birth, you experientially, it's not like in my mind, I decided that I wanted Jesus. I'm going to admit that Jesus is bigger than me and I'm going to let him be my big brother. It's not anything like that. It's an experiential. He comes into you and overwhelms you with his love. Here in his love, not that we loved him, but that he first loved us. Gave himself to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, in other words, if you stay in it, live it, consume it, become it, walk it out in shoe leather. If you abide in the word, then you're a true disciple. If you don't abide in the word, you're a false disciple. You say, well, I've had a little fit of evangelism and won everybody that I knew to Jesus in three weeks, hundreds of them. But the funny thing is, none of them would go to church, none of them would get baptized, none of them read their Bible, and none of them even will answer my phone calls now. That's because they didn't really get born again. Okay? And there's nothing in them that wants to cooperate. You, you overwhelmed them at some point, but that's not what they intended, not what they wanted. If you abide in this living word, then you're true disciples. And if you're a true disciple and you're abiding in the word, then you can know the truth. Well, you had to have some knowledge of truth to become a disciple. So he's saying the only way you get more truth is by walking out the truth you already understand. If God gives you an understanding of healing, but you refuse to pray for anybody for healing, you refuse to believe that you could be healed, you simply, in your lifestyle, reject the whole concept of healing in your mind. You say, oh, I believe in healing. But in your lifestyle, you'd completely reject it and it has no place in you. Then you're not on the way. There is a way that seems right unto a man, and that's the way of society. But the way thereof is the way of death. There is a way that seems right to the Spirit of God, and that's the way of life. And when you walk in that, you find peace and life and joy eternal. He says, if you abide in the word, true disciples, then you can know the truth. And as you're experientially knowing this truth, this truth begins to set you free progressively, day by day. Well, what are you getting free from? Most people say, well, I got free from smoking cigarettes and drinking beer. And the reality is that's not what he's talking about. You have to become free from the opinions of others. You have to hold the word of God, the living word of Christ, high in your life this is who I am, this is what I believe, this is what I do. And if Uncle Fred doesn't like it, I'm sorry. If Aunt Gertrude doesn't like it, I'm sorry. You simply do what you do without fear of contradiction and without fear of the opinions of friends or relatives who may not be tuned into the Holy Spirit. And so this truth making you free progressively means first you had to accept the truth that Christ died for our sins. See, Christ was six feet tall. That's not truth. Christ died for our sins. That's spiritual reality. Okay, we receive that. And as we walk in that, and now our life is having a new pattern. Ah, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So now that you have this new lifestyle, as you walk in that word... He gives you more word and more understanding and more understanding and more understanding and more understanding. And as you walk it out, you become free from the concerns of others, free from the oppression of the opinions of others. And see, in the body of Christ, uh, like in high school, 
so-and-so was labeled this and so-and-so, you know, she's a fatty and he's a dummy. And we label everybody all these names and we put down certain people, old four eyes, and, and we give them nicknames and we put people down all the time. But in the body of Christ, our identity is our spiritual identity. You're not the guy who lives at 116 Longleaf Road. You're the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit and walking out the will of God in your situation. You are spiritually who you are. You're not, you know, six feet tall and 220 pounds or whatever. That's not who you are. I'm sorry. Now, in the eyes of the world, all that natural stuff is very important. If you got rid of your Chevy and got a Mercedes, everybody goes, oh, very significant. If you lose weight or gain weight or, you know, you dye your hair or you don't dye your hair or whatever you're doing, the world goes, oh, looky, looky, looky. This is all very significant. And in fact, whether your hair is blonde or blue or green, purple, auburn, it doesn't make any difference. It has nothing to do with spiritual reality. My wife is the most wonderful person in the world, and it has nothing to do with her height, weight, color of hair, her beautiful teeth, her lovely complexion. It's not about all that. She has the beauty of Christ living inside. And so truth is about spiritual truth, and you can't get it beyond what you're willing to walk in. So you can be a very low-level Christian, not know much about the Bible, not walk out much, not know much about the Holy Spirit, and you can read a bunch of books and have a thousand great ideas in your mind, but as long as none of them are working out in your shoe leather, it's all meaningless. It's a hoax. It's a fake. Or as we would say, it's a fraud. Because when you project that you're someone you're not, that's a fraud. Okay? In business, if you can get somebody to sign the contract, you got it. You know, the, the check changed hands and the sign, you know, the signature went on the paper. You got it. It's a done deal. We're all good. No, no, no. If they can prove that you misrepresented this situation, then the court will say it was a fraud and throw the whole thing out. Okay. So we are those who do not misrepresent, but we are in love with the spirit of truth. John 14, 17. Let's look at a couple of scriptures in John real quick. John 14, 17 says, Jesus said, The spirit of truth, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because the world neither sees truth nor knows truth. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. There are several things we point out here that truth has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrew name, Yahshua, Hamashiach, the Messiah. Truth has to do with him, and when we find all these various truths, they all go back to him in simplified form. The little uh, bracelets and little mottos that people put around that says, what would Jesus do? Or let's take this idea, this truth, and apply it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Does it apply here? And so he is the truth. Psalms 85.10, I won't ask you to turn there. Psalm 85.10 says, Mercy and truth met together. Where? In Christ. And righteousness and peace have kissed one another. Mercy, truth, righteousness, peace, every bit of that comes and is embodied in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you can't talk about righteousness without talking about Christ. You can't define truth or discuss truth without talking about Christ and his ministry. Or peace. Peace is not when the Israelis and the Arabs sign a contract saying we're going to agree to abide by something, which, of course, they never abide by what they sign. 
which makes it the whole thing pointless. There's nothing more absurd than a newsman saying, and now we have more news on the peace treaty between the Israelis and the Arabs. <laughs> That's insane. That's not working. That's not happening. Because righteousness and truth and peace and all meet in Christ. And true peace can never be found outside of I'm in Christ, you're in Christ, we're all working in Christ together. That's peace. And anything other than that is just some people thrown in a room and hope they don't kill each other. Or thrown on a continent, continent and hope they don't kill one another. Mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace have kissed one another. So, John chapter 14 Verse 17 says, The spirit of truth, the world cannot receive the spirit of truth, and it cannot know the spirit of truth, and it cannot see the spirit of truth. And what all that means is, the world cannot identify as spirit of truth. Which means since the world is not built on a Christ consciousness, the world is not focused on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, they can never know anything about truth or peace or righteousness or joy or love or anything else. It is a corrupted form of what our Heavenly Father intended, and it is a bogus. It's like getting fake money. You know, you land, at least the last time I landed in Nigeria at the airport, it said um, over the loudspeaker, please do not exchange money with anyone in the parking lot. Uh, there's a so many percent of the money in our country is counterfeit and they prey on newcomers entering the country mm -hmm. and sure enough there's somebody out there in the parking lot trying to trade us money and the money they had they printed it at home on a printer and of course we didn't take it but you can see if you didn't know what their money really was supposed to look like and you hadn't handled a lot of their money then yeah you could you could want to make this big deal and make all this money, right? But the reality is it was bogus. It wasn't true, okay? And John spends so much time here talking about the spirit of truth. And so the world cannot identify the spirit of truth. They couldn't tell whether anything was true or not true. They do not have a clue. And anything the world says about righteousness, truth, peace, the Word, the Holy Spirit, reality, heaven, hell, anything the world says is totally meaningless and just a waste of time even discussing it. You say, well, what if the guy who wrote this book, he might be in the world, but he had a billion dollars. Foolishness. It's all bogus. Don't let them trick you. But it says, you know the spirit of truth. What does that mean? It means the world can't identify this but all Christians have the spirit of truth. If you're truly born again, you have the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth in you will speak to you or confirm in your heart that what you're seeing and hearing occurring, this is spirit of truth. Now what we say is, well, I'm going to take my mind and my understanding of the Bible since I'm so dang smart. And when I hear something or see something, I'm going to analyze it and decide if I think it's the truth. That's completely bogus. You're, you're going at it the wrong way. That's as dumb as trying to, when I was a kid, we'd go to the movies, and you'd get in the trunk trying to get in the theater. Or you'd go way around in the woods, and, and you'd sneak through the fence in the back somewhere so you didn't have to pay the entrance. The reality is the spirit of truth comes within us, and now we can identify the spirit of truth in others. You see, it's not about people's doctrine because most people's doctrine is pretty far off. Let me ask you a simple, straightforward question. Do you love your mama? Is she born again? Would you like to put your life down to certify that her doctrine is biblical? You probably wouldn't if you have good sense because she may not know that much about the Scripture. But you love her because you believe the Holy Spirit is in her and the Spirit of Truth, which is the Holy Spirit, is residing in her. And the Spirit of Truth in you witnesses to the Spirit of Truth in her. 
and now we have a spiritual connection. Now, I would call myself a seeker. I've gone to some places that uh, most people wouldn't go and looked at some religious folks that most people would just say, oh, that's insane. And I've gone to some, you know, quote unquote, cult compounds and studied the people and watch what they're doing. And I ask myself, does the Holy Spirit in me, does the Spirit of Truth in me say, yes, I like this? Or does it say, what in the world is going on? Well, most of the time it said, what in the world is going on? A few times it said, this is awesome. I'm making a wonderful connection here. My point being, you don't enter into an analysis of things with your natural mind. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Neither can he receive them, for they are foolishness unto him, because they're spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit in you rejoices when the Holy Spirit in someone else is teaching or witnessing or speaking or doing whatever they're doing and says yes. And you want to embrace them. You want to love them. You want to have fellowship with them. This is the spirit of truth connection. And that's what we make with other people, a spirit of truth connection. We cannot base our fellowship on whether everybody agrees with what we agree with. Consider this just for a moment. In the first century church, the people had access to Old Testament scripture in Greek. The only people that read Hebrew were the rabbis. But the normal people spoke Greek, and they had access to Greek copies called the Septuagint. And that's what they had. And so Paul's writing, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke are writing, and all these things are going on. Ten years pass, twenty years pass, you're a believer. You don't have a single New Testament scripture in your hand. Another ten years pass. Maybe somebody got a copy of the book of Mark and you've been born again for 30 years. And you got your first copy of any New Testament scripture. There was a book of Mark that your pastor came by and he had him a copy. See, he didn't have the scriptures because they weren't there yet. And so here's these people teaching New Testament doctrine with no New Testament scriptures. So how can that be? Same way that Abraham, we're children of Abraham by faith. Abraham obeyed God, walked in faith, sacrificed his son, did all these things. Powerful prophet. Well, what kind of Bible was he carrying around with him? He didn't have one. He had several fragments of some Old Testament things, but not anything like what we have in our Old Testament. And so a hundred years, you, you could have been 30 and got converted when Jesus had his ministry, joined the church, and lived to be 80 and died and never had your own copy of one book of the New Testament. Well, how do you know who to fellowship with? The Spirit of Truth. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of love and joy and peace. The Spirit that calls us to come up higher. The Spirit that works in us and calls us to righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, continually moving us in this direction. Okay? One time my wife and I went to look at some pit bulldog puppies. They were only six weeks old, little bitty scooters. I mean, just barely could walk without falling down. And she bent over to pick up one. There was a big litter of puppies. There was like eight or ten of them. She bent over to pick up one. And one latched onto one sleeve of her sweatshirt. And one latched onto the other sleeve. And she had a hold of one. And one got a hold of the front of her sweatshirt where she'd bent over it, jumped up and grabbed it. And she stood up with a dog in her hands. And one on each leg. She had a dog in her hands and five dogs hanging on to her and their little jaws were just locked. Now you don't have to discuss whether these are real pit bull dogs. They got the goods. It's right there in front of you. Even if you were deaf, dumb, and blind, 
when these dogs jumped over you from six different directions and locked their little jaws down on your clothes and pretty soon she starts hollering get them off of me get them off of me because that's what pit bulldogs do and i like pit bulldogs i'm not criticizing them i'm just saying that love joy and peace is what christians do walking in the word living by faith honoring jesus christ in all that you do trying to be a blessing to other people looking for ways to help somebody now, I was raised in a fundamentalist home. My dad was an independent Baptist pastor. He fellowshiped a little bit in the GARB and the BBF and a little bit with the Southern Baptists, but not too much. He thought they were pretty liberal. And so I learned a lot of anti-stuff and negative stuff, and so that was programmed in me. And when I had an experience with God when I was 20, now I took that negative radar and I radared everybody. You know what? Nobody looked very good. Because I had been misprogrammed with bad thinking. I'm not looking for righteousness, peace, and joy. I'm looking for someone who disagreed. And I read that Bible through, man. I read it through in the King James, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Give me a different version. Give me another version. Give me another version. I was reading that thing. I was working for an engineering company, and they ran out of projects. Now, they were going to have some in a couple months. And the boss said, I don't have anything for you to do. And I said, well, can I read the Bible on the job? He said, long as you don't get up and try to pray for people. He said, sit right there and read your Bible. And I had a good fat salary for three months. I read the Bible eight hours a day. No commentaries, no books about the Bible, just the Bible. And I read it over and over and over. And I would get so excited from the Word of God and so filled with the Holy Spirit, I would think my brain was going to pop. And I would have to get up and go in the bathroom and yell, Hallelujah! I was just so thrilled about Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, when we finally zero in on what God really wants, I was that guy that was a preacher's worst nightmare. If I heard him, a preacher, quote a verse and one word was off, I would just go, oh, that's disgusting. He misquoted that verse. Just one word. I was thoroughly disgusted. And one of the guys here knew me back then and knows how opinionated I was. I'm a whole lot better and 10 times sweeter and nicer and 100 times more filled with the Holy Spirit because that pit bull attack everything that disagrees with you, that's not the Holy Spirit, folks. That's something else. And in case you got a big dose of it, I'm not even going to tell you what it is because it's not very pretty. And I know because I had a big dose. One, one day, this has been... 30 years ago, I went to a service here in town. And there was a young guy there, about 35, and he was a new pastor. And this was a big church in town. They had like eight or 100 or 1,000 people. And he preached his message, and I sat there and took notes, and I critiqued, you know, that was very poor usage of Psalm 3. And that the way you illustrated what Paul said, that was not theologically correct. You should reevaluate that. And I wrote him a long, a whole page, a notebook page, critiquing his sermon. Well, do you know how much righteousness, peace, and joy, and love I got from the sermon? Zero. The only thing I got from the sermon was a chance to argue and struggle in my mind. That's not right. 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 Well, somebody ought to just rebuke the devil in yourself because we most of us have been there. And the reality is the Holy Spirit functions and gives us the ability. The spirit of truth in us identifies with the spirit of truth in others, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit and the fruit and gifts of the Spirit. And everything in you should be saying yes and amen to everything there. Now, I, I, my brain still works. I can go to a church service, and if someone says, 
a whole bunch of things that are just completely off the wall. I just smile and, you know, grip my teeth and uh, say, praise the Lord and go on. Because that person, whoever you think their doctrine is or whatever you think their understanding is, that person is doing the best they can. If they could do any better, they would. Remember back when you were in the situation and you were doing the best you can? That's all I'm doing today, folks. I'm doing the best I can. And now I'm understanding that the Holy Spirit in me, the Spirit of Truth reaches out and touches the Spirit of Truth in other people. And now I would never want to misrepresent someone. Instead of saying, oh, that was a really bad sermon, I'm telling you, that guy needs to go straight back to seminary and get his money back. Instead of that, now I would say, aha, Lord, help them and give them understanding. The next time they get in that word, open it up and just let the Holy Spirit be their guide. Pray for them. Don't criticize them. Encourage them. Don't give them a whole, man, I think of the look on that guy's face. I gave him that whole sheet of paper critiquing his sermon. And one thing I told him, he used an illustration about Israel going through the Red Sea, and I just said, that is an absurd illustration. You need to clean up your act, pal. I mean, I read this guy, the riot act, and, and I got all the way out by the door, and I turned around and looked, and his face was going like... Because, you see, I was approaching him through my mind, checking his mind, and my mind and your mind are not on the same wavelength. There's always stuff that's different. One lady here is Chinese. She's got things going through her mind that aren't in my mind. Maybe never will be. And I've got things going on in my mind that may never be in her mind. Some of the cultural things. Some spiritual things. But you have to approach people with the righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, God gives us the ability to identify the Spirit of Truth. John 15, 26. Give you another one real quick. John 15, 26. Jesus said, When the Helper comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, now it calls him the Helper. It's a Greek word, parakletos. The Helper who comes alongside you to help carry your burden, to help lift the, the weight you know, in terms of a housewife to help you sweep the floor, uh, or in terms of an accountant to help you get the addendum ready for the new numbers for the expansion or whatever. The helper, the Holy Spirit comes along to help you spiritually. You and I have been assigned a spiritual task that we cannot do correctly without some help. And so the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth comes and helps us in all that Father assigns for us to do. He says, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. So, calls him the helper, the paraclete, the one who's walking alongside, helping you carry the burdens of life. Then it calls him the Spirit of truth. Then it says he proceeds from the Father. And I don't want to do any theology tonight, but historically, there have been some real big discussions. Here, he says, the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father. That's single processionism. And then if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and Son, that would be a dual or a double procession uh, of the Holy Spirit. Just some theological stuff that people wrestle with. But it says, he, verse 26, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the helper, will testify of me. What does that mean? It means the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to connect Christ's life and ministry to truth. What do you want to know about the truth of peace? Well, look at Christ's life and ministry. How are you going to put this together? The Holy Spirit will help you. What do you want to know about righteousness? Look at Christ's ministry. Well, how are you going to get this fit together in your mind? The Holy Spirit's going to help you. And so you have Christ's ministry and all these principles of truth and grace and peace and reconciliation and love and all that. How will you ever get a handle on what love is? The Holy Spirit will help you to bring Christ's life and ministry and love together in a cohesive way in your mind. 
with the help of the Spirit of Truth. He's helping you all the time. He helps you by adjusting your thinking. He helps you by bringing scriptures to light. He helps you by taking this scripture on love and helping you to understand how that's Christ. Or Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Well, that's a principle. That's a truth principle. The Holy Spirit comes and helps us understand and visualize and comprehend how Christ is the vine and we are the branches. A lot of these things don't make sense till the Holy Spirit quickens it to us. He says, you will testify of me and you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. And so the helper, the paraclete, the spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ, he gives us the ability to get a hold of these spiritual truths with Christ and put them together in our mind so that it makes a real, you know, presentable, understandable concept, something we can get out there to where we can live this out right in front of people and it becomes real in our lives. John chapter 16, another one real quickly. We're doing some work here in John. John chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> when he, Jesus is speaking, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority. But whatever he hears, that he will speak. And so the picture is this. God the Father is talking to you and encouraging you and helping you and ministering to you. But every bit of it is coming to you through the Holy Spirit. And where does he live? In you. So Father speaks to his spirit, which is in you, which is standing next to and in covenant with your human spirit. And so that information comes into you at all times. There is a problem because usually there's a blockage. We have all these things that block what the Holy Spirit's trying to say and do to and in and through us. It is a problem. I'm not making up a problem. I'm just letting you know there is a problem. If you're going to get fired on your job tomorrow, the Holy Spirit in you already knows that, and He's told you ten times, but you probably haven't gotten it yet because you're not listening. You're not tuned in. And that's what I'm saying. Uh, the Holy Spirit in you is sensitive enough. If your wife is coming home, the Holy Spirit will feel her coming a mile, two miles away, and you'll immediately start thinking of her, and you should say, oh, she's almost here. The Holy Spirit is continually giving you information, thoughts and feelings and expressions, and all these marvelous things. The Spirit of Truth guides us into truth, spiritual truth and a lot of just basic information, but He guides us into truth. Why are there 55 denominations of Baptists and a dozen Presbyterian and the Reformed and the Methodists and unlimited numbers? There are hundreds of denominations just in America. Why is that so? Because people aren't led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's leading us all in the same truth. The Spirit of Truth witnesses the same thing to every person. And the fact that we are so divided is a statement and a proof of our inability to hear from the Holy Spirit. If you're antagonistic and angry and like to argue with other Christians, enough said. You just proved you're not led by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit never leads you to read your Bible or fast or pray or get concerned about other people's spiritual condition, if the Holy Spirit never impresses some things on you strongly, there's proof in the pudding that you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Greek word sons is weos. It means a full-grown son. And so, as many as read their Bible every day are the sons of God? No. As many as tithe to their church are the sons of God? No. 
as many as like a good theological argument are the sons of God? No. As many as are led by the Holy Spirit. And the fact that uh, the fact that preachers will get up and push and pull and beg and grab and, and twist people to get a, a big offering. If the people were led by the Holy Spirit, you just say, well, it's offering time. Give us the Holy Spirit directs and he would direct everyone to give the right amount and it would always be in there and there would never be any statement of we need this or blah, 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 blah. None of that could ever happen. The fact that we do all these things is a testimony that people are not being led by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth comes. He guides you into truth. He guides you into lifestyle. He guides you into conduct. He guides you continually about everything in your life. Isn't that awesome? And whatever he hears from the Father, he speaks to you. So that's your conduit. How can you not be excited about the Holy Spirit when everything God has ever done or will ever do for you comes through the Spirit to you by the Holy Spirit? God leads you how? By the Holy Spirit. Everything that happens comes through the Holy Spirit. That's your point of contact. You know, when I was a little kid, Sunday afternoon, Oral Roberts was on TV, and he'd say, reach out your hand to the television as a point of contact. And people, everybody, and, you know, thousands of people every day, I'm reaching my hand for the point of contact. And people made fun of him and all that stuff. But the reality is there is a point of contact with God, but it's not your TV screen. It's the Holy Spirit. Everything God says and does in and through and to you comes through the Holy Spirit. So if there's anything we ought to be experts on, we need to know something about the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That's John 16, 13. He guides us into all truth. He brings truth directly from Father's lips right into your ear. Straight from Father's lips right into your ear. Woo, is that exciting or what? And notice he ends by saying, he will tell you things to come. Let's say it this way. He warns and prepares you for what lies ahead. If you've never had any legal troubles, never been involved in messy lawsuits or any problems like that, and suddenly someone is planning, and boy, they're writing the documents, and they're getting ready to sue your socks off. The Holy Spirit won't allow you to enter that without telling you. He'll tell you a dozen times. And he's whispered in your ear, you're entering a season of legal activity. Get your house in order. Stuff is going to happen. Lawsuit is coming. He's whispering all that, and if you're not hearing it, that's your fault. He's saying it. Do you think Christians are just as gullible as regular old folks without the Holy Spirit? They sure are. I'm, I'm sorry. What we're studying in the Word is what God intended for you and what the Holy Spirit wants to do. The reality is, look at all the studies that have been made. Born-again, Spirit-filled Christian girls going to the university have the same level of sexual activity as girls that are, have no interest in God at all, same level of sexual activity. Well, why is that? Because they haven't gotten to be led by the Holy Spirit yet. They're just behaving like regular folks. Now, their parents don't know they're behaving like regular folks, or they'd stop the money. When I went to the University of Texas in 1966, I joined a fraternity and all I did is get drunk and smoke weed and chase girls all day long. I didn't go to class or anything. So when they sent my dad a copy of my first report card, guess what? It's over, son. He said, I will never give you another dollar for your education. He sent me like five grand that semester. I will never give you another dollar for your education as long as I live, so help me God. And he was faithful to that promise. He never gave me another dollar 
for my education. So now I had to get a job at an engineering company studying engineering, studying engineering in school, doing engineering on the job, and I didn't have time to get drunk, and I didn't have time to smoke weed. And now I started sobering up and looking at my life going, hey, you can't live like this. And so I had an experience with God. I was truly born again, and I started teaching Sunday school, and I started going to this great church, and they had a great pastor, and it was just an awesome experience. But the reality is God warns you and prepares you for what lies ahead. What lies ahead for you? Whatever it is, you better talk to the Holy Spirit and find out what it is because if you know what it is, you'll know how to prepare. If you don't know what it is, you won't be prepared and whether you get a bonus or get fired, it'll be a shock and you'll be all upset and oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And all these things are going on and the Holy Spirit is continually keeping you updated. And I just wanna close our teaching night by saying I am excited that the Holy Spirit all these years, especially the last 20, probably 25 years, since I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Before that, I wasn't doing too good about the Holy Spirit. But when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, from then on, He started leading me and guiding me and telling me what was ahead. And so I was always warned. I was always ready. And so nothing took me by surprise. And even if something bad was coming, I could feel it coming. I'd say, dear, something negative is about to happen. It's going to happen this week. I'm not sure what it is, but I can feel it coming like a black cloud. And so we better stay prayed up and stay in the Word and, and be prepared. And then whatever that was would happen, and we'd go through that and go on. But whatever you're doing today, the Holy Spirit warns you and prepares you for what lies ahead. So let's yield everything up to the blessed Holy Spirit and let Him take that info right from God's lips to our ears and cause us to be the holy, anointed, excited, discerning, capable, powerful, wonderful, loving, kind, gracious, peaceful people of God that we're supposed to be. That's our portion. That's our inheritance. Filled with the spirit of truth, walking in truth, loving, giving and receiving love, helping others every chance you get. How could it be any better than this? The world has no early warning system, but God will tell you in advance exactly what's coming, or maybe not exactly, but at least He gives you the idea so you, can, you know how to prepare and you can set your house in order. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He does all things well. Next week, we're going to finish our teaching. I only got halfway through here. But we want to talk some more, and any of you that have questions, uh, you can email them to me or on Facebook. I'm at Jerry Calvin McKinney. You can ask a question on there, and I'll try and address some things as we go along. But the Holy Spirit is our point of contact, and all is well. Amen. Love you guys.